Uh, so yeah, welcome everybody. Welcome to all of our guests. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our series of the TRC 57 speakers. Uh, we've got a, a terrific guest for you today with uh, some amazing experience. Uh, following our protocols, I'm going to turn it over to Tsongkwat and to uh, create our safe space and uh, open our house. Uh, Haitka Tito Siam E. Tot Mastima, the Tanaquail Haitka at the High All Eight Squail D. Quam Sewa Thamsh E. Quam Quam Stuch Tanchqualamans at a L. E. Nashwalaqua D. Quam Lotlamat at Sep at the Selchanst E. the Schwabalit E. the Smananst Ti we at an quas hua kika this e kaki mistimuch. Ti huam stletakan stoch siamnus quamuch. Haitka quats hua ye a tana tamach a tana quail e ta max quail. Now ash quam quams the nuts of the title siam haitka. 
Sam, as always, for creating that space for us here, welcoming our ancestors and the generations to come to join us, wrap around, and uh, share some words. Uh, my name is uh, Ted Cadwallader. I'm the Director of Instruction here in Nanaimo Ladysmith Public Schools. Um, and I want to raise my hands to my two amazing co-hosts, Stephanie Johnson and uh, Lawrence Mitchell. Uh, we're here to uh, uh, spend some time with a series of speakers so that uh, we can gain their knowledge to help us learn how to walk better on the territory of the Snotnolis, Snanemo, and Tamanis peoples, uh, territories that they've looked after here on the west coast of what is now Canada, on the south end of what is now uh, called Vancouver Island. Um, we have been on this path for a bit, uh, and we've learned a lot as we've traveled along from the guests that we've had as part of this speaker series. I also want to raise my hands to uh, Carrie Kilmartin and UBC Press, who've been instrumental in connecting us with our series of speakers. And today we are pleased to welcome uh, from the uh, Spask clan, from the Bear clan of Chickasaw First Nation, uh, and a, a, a wonderful guest who's had an amazing uh, experience over the course of his lifetime and continues to have an amazing experience, some of which we'd shared before we came on live today. Um, he's been a legal advisor to the Mi'kmaq Nation. Uh, Four Directions Council at the UN Working Group on Indigenous Peoples, Research Director, um, uh, Grandfather, Father, uh, Spouse, and we're most pleased to welcome today uh, James Sakesh Youngblood Anderson. Uh, welcome, welcome Sakesh, and, uh, and the floor is yours, and we're so pleased to have you with us today. Chokma Kwe Madawalain. Wadahala Dalok Niok, Wichi Hananus Gayas Gluk Samagina. I just sort of said in Cheyenne Cree, uh, please help me teach to the best of ability today uh, in two languages, because uh, it's a difficult and amazing experience that I'm going to talk about. It hasn't really reached the point of being a story yet because it's an ongoing story, but it's about a quest of a few gener of a first generation uh, to try and make things better. But I send you greetings to all of those who've taken up their precious time, other lives to gather to watch this event in their homelands. And I'm speaking from the, as a guest from Treaty 6 territory. And I wanna send acknowledgement to all the spirits of our ancestors to the ones who have passed knowledge of the earth and how to be humans to us and to acknowledge our way of life has been under attack for many, many generations. And we still struggle to maintain the teachings. And while many voices have gone silent over the generations and many are still in risk of going silence, it is a long struggle to keep our our languages and our way of life alive, and also our teachings. So I send acknowledgement to those our people who have been and continue to revitalize our inherent rights and our way of life for future generations locally and regionally, nationally and internationally. And this talk is part of the story, but it sort of has a theme that says, when we come together, and share our teachings and stories and our experiences that we'll find the strength to continue as indigenous people and to maintain our connections to our family and to our sovereign ecologies. This is a story about ancient visions turning into provisions of the constitution and the UN declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples that We've always had ancient teachings and visions in Aboriginal society that touch our human spirit and animate intangible beliefs and work against artificial structures. But I've been guided and 
many indigenous people have been guided by uh, a teachings that comes from our elders that says that a human being who has a vision is not able to use that power of it until they have performed it and realized it for people to see. And this story is a small part of that, is that we had a vision about a way to make life better for indigenous peoples, to help them out. And we did that first by changing the constitution of Canada. But we also at the same time, and even before that, we realized that we would have to intervene in the global world and uh, try to create a, a dialogue of to fix the mixed information, the myths and the stereotypes of indigenous people that was created by them. And also to create a, a dialogue, most likely an argument most of the time about a alternative possible future uh, in various high legal cultures. So this story is really a story of one generation struggle, an approximate of an enigmatic in between of a smaller indigenous world confronting and trying to relate to a larger global world. And the experience of that dialogue is deeper and more interesting than any theory before us. And theories before us pale in comparison to the actual experience um, but it's an engagement in bad faith, in dealing with people who believe in certain institutions like the nation state, but only so far as they can. And it's a story about how do you close the ironic distancing between conformity to dominant belief systems and knowledge systems uh, to become more or less an insider. But the story for me begins really with George Manuel and also Philip Deere. The George Manuel you're pretty familiar with as a Sushop Nation Chief and President of NIB and President of the Union of BC Indians. But like all Indigenous people, he was moved by the white paper, which was really a failed attempt to implement a convention on preventing racial discrimination. That the impetus for the white paper didn't come from domestic thought, it came from international thought with the Canada agreeing to the convention on elimination of racial discrimination. And the first thing they tried to do to eliminate racial discrimination was to end Indian status and turn us into provincial citizens as equality and therefore we they would end racial discrimination as the first step and we saw this as just an atrocious attempt to disregard our treaties and our aboriginal rights and our inherent rights and who we were and we fought back um and george really led a battle with that with Harold Cardinal that George was really an administrative assistant uh, to um, Harold Cardinal. Uh, Harold Cardinal uh, convinced him to run for president of National Indian Brotherhood uh, because he didn't want to do it himself and George did that and he emerged as a such a, a deeper person than just a, a Sushwap nation leader he became a leader of the whole world and he captured this in the book called The Fourth World in Indian Reality, which is still in print today. It was put out in 1974, but it started describing an indigenous reality that caught on. And in the same year the book came out, uh, George was invited to go down to uh, Paraguay to uh, participate in the first conference of indigenous peoples of the Southern Cone and delivered the talk about of the fourth world. Um, the next year, he invited people back to Fort Alberni for the second indigenous conference of indigenous people. 
and all the delegates from all the conferences got together and created the first uh, NGO in the international sense called the World Council of Indigenous Peoples. Um, but it was in about 1975 that Harold first, or George first endorsed the idea of a national conference for indigenous peoples. And in 1977, as a prophecy and a visionary, he created the idea that we're going to draft an international declaration to uphold and protect indigenous peoples. Now in Canada, many of the chiefs couldn't even comprehend what he was talking about because of their experience, that he had the vision and he decided that he would go forth and perform that vision. And there he met up with my um, elder and leader, Philip Deer from the Wind Clan of the Muscogee Indian Nations, what people call the Creek Nations. And he was a leader, a spiritual leader of the indigenous, indigenous or the in International Indian Treaty Council. And when we were, were discussing the trail of treaties in the United States in about 1976 and so on, we did the trail of treaties. He started talking about the Indigenous youth don't know who they are. They don't know they're human. They keep calling themselves Indians instead of their tribal names. They don't reconstruct who they are. And we had to correct that problem. And we had to correct that problem by going to the, what he called the Eagle's Nest in Geneva uh, to address the world and to correct it there because we just couldn't correct it from one side of the US. And there we went through and created the, um, the first NGO conference on racial discrimination. The next year we wrote a big declaration on the principles of the defense of the indigenous nation and peoples of the Western hemisphere. And then we went to the fourth uh, Russell tribunal on the rights of American Indians on treaty violations in 1980. And um, Philip's uh, daughter, was the one who translated what would be called the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into Muscogee and, and in 2016, the Muscogee Nation adopted uh, that provision. But this struggle is to me characterized as a struggle of getting beyond wishful thinking. And it's a, about a struggle with the world. You know, my experiences uh, conjure up all this, and it's really more about humans that I've known and met, both indigenous and non-indigenous, against the background of this thing called a timeline or history. But it was really an unforeseen project of liberation uh, with a battle with the world, because it was a battle about the idea of humanity and its relationship to situation or circumstances. Now, the whole issue that we encountered in the constitutional talks in Canada was the issue that we, as an Aboriginal people in Canada at the conferences, wanted to push human rights into the constitution. And uh, we were told in a really arrogant way by many people there that the indigenous human rights covenants and treaties that Canada has ratified didn't apply to us because um, we were the wrong kind of people. And we were sort of shocked by that. I mean, yes, in, 19, in 1876 in the Indian Act, they defined Indians as anyone other than a person and that had lasted till about 1950, but we thought, at least the leaders at that time thought they had won that battle when they got it pulled out of the Indian Act. But the idea that we were inferior type of species, I guess is the right word, 
uh, really shocked us. I mean, we knew we were discriminated and oppressed and all this stuff. And we knew there were all these divisions in the humanities that they talked about. But really, we thought these divisions were fairly shallow. And we knew from Eurocentric history that these divisions of history never last forever. They're always changing. And so we decided at that time through Alec Dinney that we were going to uh, pursue this concept of human rights in a, a more powerful way during the Constitutional Conference. And he authorized me to, for the Micmac Nation, to go to the UN Human Rights Council at that time and make a claim against Canada that Canada was denying uh, Micmac uh, treaty rights. And they were also denying Micmac um, right to self-determination and also the right to be involved in public affairs. And we sent that uh, complaint off. We drafted it in seven, 1979 or 78, somewhere around there. And we basically argued for the principles of equal rights and self-determination of peoples uh, under the International Covenant of Civil and Political uh, Rights and, and the optional protocol that allowed you to go to the UN to come complained against the nation. Well, Canada went pretty crazy about the idea of us doing this. Um, but we had decided that we would anticipate and force this dialogue with them. If they weren't going to do it in the constitutional processes, they were going to have to do it to the UN processes, which were mostly just uh, a written process. There's no oral hearings or things like that. But we wanted to force Canada to, to confront its own attempt to deny our Aboriginal and treaty rights. And the idea of Alec Denny as the grand captain of the Mi'kmaq nation was that if you wanted to herd moose or deer into a trap, you have to do it from two sides. You can't do it from one side. And so we had to have the UN be one side, the United Kingdom the other side, uh, to push Canada into the trap to get our Aboriginal and treaty rights. Uh, our Canada's response was uh, really categorical denial. First, it said the recognition of self-determination would destroy the national unity and territorial integrity of Canada. And we said, I don't know how that happens because without our treaties, you wouldn't be there. Your treaties are a part of us, we're not a part of you. But the second thing they said is our treaties are not valid international or even national doctrines. They wanted to say they're just a bunch of contracts with a bunch of colonists. And then they fell into the trap. And that's, they said that the proposed constitutional resolution that recognizes Aboriginal and treaty rights will resolve this communication to the UN. And we pushed them and pushed them on that point in particular uh, to get them deeper and deeper into the trap. And then we sprung that trap in London in the parliament where they said, you can't go forward with the Canada Act without Aboriginal and treaty rights that we created uh, in a different century, in a different time, that these have to be passed over to you as succession. And that was sort of the trap. But we got the Aboriginal and treaty rights provisions affirmed in, in the Constitution of Canada. But yet when we called the constitutional process after that, the prime minister didn't invite the treaty nations or the Aboriginal nation holders to the meeting. They just wanted the national organizations. And so we appealed again to, Kent, uh, to the UN Human Rights uh, Committee 
uh, it's then called Micmac Society versus Canada, to say that we're being denied the right to be involved in public affairs by the prime minister not inviting us as a treaty holder under section 35 to address the grievances instead picked on national organizations that it funded to be the spokesman to us. And yes, we had a role to play in those organizations, but our self-determination required that we have to do that. Canada's response also was crazy on that point. They started out with a proposition is that the human rights uh, conventions and treaties don't apply to Canada because Canada isn't a colonial state. And that was really shocking to read for us that we knew they were a colonial state. We knew that, you know, our treaties are with the United Kingdom and the British sovereign had nothing to do with the government of Canada. And so it did apply to us. And then Canada's other response that was more uh, threatening and uh, more correct in a, a certain way is that they said the Human Rights Committee cannot hear individual, cannot hear collective rights like self-determination. They can only hear individual rights. And so we lost on that point eventually with the Human Rights Committee saying, if you want self-determination, you have to go to the General Assembly of the United Nations. They're the only ones who can say uh, you have human rights or you have the right of self-determination. So then we shifted and our constitutional talks were over and we shifted into high gear to go to the newly created working group on indigenous peoples to assert that right. But uh, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention Sandra Lovelace and her 1990 case that I worked on with her um, uh, a law professor from a UNB uh, on her uh, denial of cultural rights under the UN Human Rights Committee. And that gave me enough experience with drafting the communications for Alec Denny um, and the Micmac Nation uh, to proceed. But she sort of cut the swath through there, through the UN. And in her case, we were, we found Canada was found in breach of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights in denying her the right to be a, a Maliseet um, just because she had married a, a white person. So that, that was a sort of a preview to Alec Denny, and I should have mentioned that. Um, but, you know, we, um, when we went to the UN, uh, we were really uh, joined by uh, a Willie Littlechild and uh, from the Cree Nation and, and Ted Moses from the James Bay Cree uh, Nation and Daly Sambo from Indigenous uh, Circumpolar Conference Council. You know, all of these people came together uh, through the Indigenous Preparatory Meetings. And they, they were an interesting process. But the, to make a, the world, the Working Group on Indigenous Populations um, was created really in about 19, 62 or 63. And what they did is it was part of a, a strange conglomeration that it was really part of the, the subdivision on the protection of minorities. Uh, and we argued and uh, presented good arguments that they should really separate indigenous people from minorities because while as of, we were in fact a minority, we were the founding people of the, the continents and we didn't want to be considered minorities in our own homelands. Yes, we've been overrun uh, by a bunch of settlers and things like that that was beyond most of our control, 
and beyond our con treaties, and we're a violation of most of our treaties, but we had to be different. They didn't quite buy the argument, but eventually through a Norwegian professor, uh, he created the Working Group on Indigenous Peoples. And this was a week at the end of July formally was set aside for our Working Group on Indigenous Peoples. Um, excuse me, it was Indigenous Populations. We fought all the time. And I still have the scars of being a population to people, singular to peoples with an S. Those are all different battles we had to fight. Um, but that was the main platform um, that we used and we spread out from that platform to all parts of the United Nations once we got together and what we decided to do. That in the original meeting, there was only about 17 organizations, it was only three or four that were from actual nations, the Mi'kmaq nations and the Cree nation. Uh, the other people were indigenous organizations and their memberships. And that was always a tension between who did they represent and who had the right to, to say things. And in the original meetings, almost everyone was from North America. But that quickly, quickly changed and pretty much we became uh, the largest UN meeting uh, on a year to year basis with more than a, a thousand participants, um, indigenous participants from all over the continent. Once we created this forum, everyone came to our amazement and they came with a, a whole lot of street fighters, but very few diplomats. And so we had to slowly teach them that dignity is really the currency of human rights. And they couldn't be street warriors and belligerent as they are in their home territory, as they are fighting against military dictatorships and other peoples that we knew that we had a shattered, terrible world we were living in, but we also had some magnificent traditions about how to relate to people. And so we tried to use those traditions to forge our, our preparatory meetings, which were very important, um, uh, usually a week before the actual meeting. But the real meetings went on all year long in different kind of context. The, and the indigenous preparatory meetings were really led by Kenneth uh, Deer, which we always consider the grandfather of the working group on indigenous populations. He's a Mohawk nation from Katnawagi person. Um, his name is the fire still burns, is his spiritual name. And that was so appropriate that he was an educator first, and then he became a journalist, publisher, editor of the Eastern Door newspaper. And in 1987, he joined the Working Group on Indigenous Populations and quickly became the organizer of the preparatory meetings. And then much later, as the coordinator of the Indigenous Caucus at the UN Geneva. And he elaborated and edited all the declarations um, in many ways since 1995. I think right now he's the CEO of, um, or the secretary of the Mohawk Nation and the CEO of the World uh, Indigenous Association, but a very powerful, kind person who could chair meetings with a lot of delicacy. The grandmother of the working group was Dr. Mrs. Erica Diaz. She never let us talk to her as doctor without putting in the missus, which was really interesting. We loved it. Um, but she was from the Greek delegation of the UN General Assembly and she became the grandmother of the working group of indigenous people when she became the chair of it in 1984 and to 2000. 
and she was a remarkable woman. Just, we used to call her concrete for short when we were talking about her in code as all indigenous people, because she was unmovable um, in many ways. And she was rough and mean to us, um, would only give us five minutes, insisted we not talk about every um, atrocity that befell us, but get to the point of what we wanted. She was un, once she became focused on a target, she became a firm and frequent use of the gavel and her, but she had this unflinching democratic ability to quiet someone at the same time gathering the substance of their message, which no one else seemed to have as the chairperson. It was a real gift, but she became over time a devoted staunch and surgical advocate for human rights of indigenous peoples because she knew the UN system more than any of us did. But she captured the idea that the working group was a place of uncensored political debate, even though we're limited to five to three minute statements. You know, she wanted a place where indigenous people could claim their rights and explain their their culture, their worldview, their visions, their cosmology, but really what did we want the UN to do, which was a totally strange idea to indigenous consciousness. We could explain what is, but we really had trouble with what ought to be, except in the most vaguest terms. And uh, those vaguest terms are really vague. <laughs> You know, like kindness. We, you know, they wouldn't let us use kindness very often, and the elders would start talking about love, and she'd get gaveling them, saying, "We can't talk about love. It's so indispensable in the world, but in the UN, we can only talk about it as well-being." And we would look at each other and say, "Well-being? That's not love. What can? What's well-being?" But anyway. Those were the UN rules and human rights. They never would let us, we would write in love and uh, declaration and it would get crossed out and come back to us as well-being. And we would argue with that for a while. But she prepared and I assisted her and Russell Barsh assisted her and uh, Mona Jackson, uh, Ma Maori and Ten or I could spend the rest of my time talking about it, but I won't. All of us were part of the drafting committee. And our job was after the week in July, and after everyone had translated everything into one of the languages, we would try and sift through and put together what is the ought? What do they want? What's the recommendation that will solve this? And we had major problems with that uh, because then we'd have to take it back at the preparatory meetings before the next working group and say, this is what we think we heard. This is the English language version or the Spanish language version or the French language versions. And we'd hammer out um, what we thought would be better language. And that was never an easy task. And when I read the declaration, it's like getting whipped um, for doing some wrong uh, because everyone would disagree with some parts of it. That's even before we got to the nation states. We had a, a real division in the, the indigenous caucus that many of the representatives and delegates from South and Latin America were from the labor movement. Um, most of them had been promoted to this job through the ILO um, discussions and they were labor leaders of indigenous peoples. But they were all communist Marxists in orientation. And in our preparatory 
meetings, we had to confront that we don't want you to talk about the fire of Eurocentric thought. What we want you to do is translate that into your indigenous part of yourself, the one that's been suppressed. We've got to get beyond Eurocentricism. And that became known in our thing as the fire in uh, so many different ways. Um, but it became a code word that eventually we developed called Eurocentricism. You know, and we would always um, say that we didn't start the fire, it was already burning, and we're trying to fight it, and we're trying to make it better. You know, but the fire was really the obstacle that, you know, all the knowledge and ideologies of the UN, which was vast, I mean, the agendas and strategies at the UN is just a maze of, of things that you've never encountered, you think, indigenous people are diverse in their thoughts, wait until you get to the UN. But they all seem to agree and they all seem to disagree at the same time. And they do it in different languages and you, you get it through a translation. And the translation is really diplomatic because the UN translators are very good at not saying what other people are saying or really saying, but really putting it in a good thing. So, this Eurocentric idea that we all had, we were all educated in. The elders and other people had to teach that out of us, even if we were uh, from English speaking North America, we were colonized and we didn't know it. We just knew it was the fire, but the fire had two parts to it. One was the Eurocentricism, you know, and all of its assumptions and its illusions. But the other part of the fire was this human movement against aristocracies, against kingdoms, against uh, nobilities of the people in Europe and other places who devised the idea of rights against governments and also the idea of liberation on an individual level uh, against government as emancipation. And that was a fire that for the last 200 years had been burning in Europe and created all the innovations that we had to fight the Eurocentric fire in a knowledge system, but we also had to build on, on the ideas of human rights under the law, of, rule of law, and the idea that uh, liberation is possible and the new modif modification of that dem democratic idea of human rights. And we had to make it better because it was as Eurocentric as anything else. And so we couldn't just leave it uh, like that. So that was our, our major, major battles that were going on in the preparatory meetings. And only when we got to the nation states did it even get worse. But we really had to realize that no matter what terrible, painful experience this was, that there was a core of this that we're really trying to achieve first for us, but also for the entire world. That before 1971 as an arbitrary date, the UN had never discussed indigenous peoples, much less indigenous people having rights that indigenous people were not seen as humans, as I said. And even when they did sort of think us humans, um, they considered us not peoples. And even when they considered us peoples, they did not consider us equal to all other humans or peoples. And so we used to you know, tease each other in the serpent lounge, which was a lounge that's attached to the big lecture halls that we're ghosts. You know, we're invisible people, but we exist and we had to establish our vote, our vote, our voice, because our people needed us to. And that this wasn't a matter of ideology. This was a matter of life or death and oppression for everyone. 
and poverty and moving out of poverty, but moving out of it in a certain way. And it wasn't about race, although we had to participate and fight against race and other kinds of oppression. So we developed a sort of a, a theory of shared persuasion as a, a model of civility that we had to teach and imperfectly live up to uh, during the course of the working group and developing the declaration and sort of in short phrases, it was dignity over violence, truth over deception, integrity over hypocrisy and humanity over state. And these were all geared toward creating an imagined possibility of having a declaration on human rights that really was based on the idea of inherent dignity and rights. And the key one was uh, the right to self-determination. And in the process of drafting the declarations, the many declarations as they came out each year, slowly the UN bureaucracy started to shift to a gradual acceptance of the fact that the plight of indigenous people is an appropriate item on the agenda for human rights and self-determinations, which was a victory in itself, because it had never, when we first raised it in chorus, all the diplomats, polished diplomats of the UN system said, if you're right, you're going to destroy the entire United Nations system, because it's based on nation states. And we said, it is not based on nation states. It says nothing about the nation states really in the charter. It says it's about human rights. And if you have human rights, we should have human rights. They should be equal, but they're equal in different knowledge systems and legal systems, not in yours. And that's the old fire again of Eurocentricism, saying everything comes from us and if you don't assimilate to us, you get nothing. But there was a shift, slow shift and a gradual shift in the human rights discourses of moving from involuntary or forced assimilation uh, to the promotion of a sustainable autonomy and self-determination. And these are a normative solution of a generation has now become the normative challenge of the current and, and future generations. The, uh, the battle of um, being considered a people, being considered a, a human was really a lengthy battle uh, between many things that worked all at once. Um, the UN system itself is um, complex, multilateral, layer after layer, but its fundamental ideas or its vision of peace, dignity, and equality on a healthy planet was a good one that we could all buy into. It's just the system couldn't walk its talk. It couldn't live up to its vision it couldn't perform its vision, and we forced it to perform its vision in part. But all of it is a very slow and cumbersome process that's really built up on dialogue that um, is a different dialogue than indigenous dialogue, but it's still a, a dialogue. That the committee itself is very structured. I don't want to get into it because it takes all day to explain the maze of the UN. Because as I mentioned before in a talk, you know, the UN is a place where the alphabet goes to die because everything's initialized because you have six languages and you can't translate them all. So everyone initializes something and you move through and initialize things. That the UN is always an organization that's not just the sum of the nation states, as we argued, but it is comprised of something that goes beyond the nation states that the nation states are built on, but they don't want to recognize 
and that's peoples and peoples with ideas uh, versus peoples with violence. And that's the common goal of the UN Charter, but the UN is also an organization of these nation states. These nation states are uh, really artificial entities. They're compromises, they're deals of a, another age and another time and another liberation movement. But once they get acknowledged as a nation state, they start changing into another artificial world and then they forget about the human component and they don't wanna talk about the human component. They only wanna talk about the nation state component in the General Assembly. And we saw that as their fundamental flaw that they can't do that and it doesn't work. Uh, back to my thoughts again. I can spend all day criticizing the UN. Um, but the issue of, um, we created a draft declaration in the working group. We submitted it to the Commission on Human Rights, uh, which has to approve it. Um, there we met a lot of opposition, especially from Canada and Russia. Um, they didn't like the idea of human rights. They still are lukewarm to the idea of human rights. And we think that's because they're such a young nation, really forged in 1942, but, uh, or excuse me, 1982, but really it was a colony for all the time they tried to present themselves as a state. Um, they, Humphreys had developed a um, person from McGill, um, Montreal, had developed the human rights covenants, the UN declarations, only to have Canada vote against it when it came up at the UN, which was a betrayal. So we were used to the human rights betrayal of Canada, that while they always had leaders in the human rights movement, Canada itself was never the leader. It usually voted against it and it never wanted to implement any of the things it ratified. Um, so with that, with the impasse in the um, Human Rights Committee, the Human Rights Commission, as it was then called, created another working group on the draft declaration um, in 1994 and we went through another process of revising this. And this was a really a brutal process mm -hmm. where the indigenous people, for one reason or other, uh, that mystified me, but it really wasn't a big surprise. Um, they had developed the idea and I, I thought it was an unsustainable idea that there could be no changes, no amendments to the working group's draft declaration, that it was their declaration and the nation states couldn't change it. This was really unsustainable because the nation states in the first draft, the only thing that survived of the draft declaration that wasn't marked up by some nation was gender equality, which was the biggest issue in the Indigenous Caucus. Uncle, we, we've got about five minutes left and I know that you're getting into the meat of the struggle and I can feel the toll it's taking to, to recount this story. So I just wanted to let you know we've got a few minutes left. Good, because I, what I want to say is that we fought that battle. We got the declaration through, but the declaration is just a piece of paper that's really an indigenous tradition transformed into human rights language. That what we were doing, what we said we were doing versus the nation state, which they don't understand still, is we were developing the guidelines for, re for reconciliation about how do you become a self-determining indigenous person? That was our goal. Every clause is trying to tell you, telling the states too, but telling indigenous people 
that they have this spirit, which self-determination in our language becomes ilnu. Ilnu is a self-determining person, but most people think it means person, but it doesn't mean self-person. It means really self-determining in the Algonquin languages. Mm -hmm. But the self-determination is a collective project. It's falling back and advancing and it's always going to be flawed and unfinished, but each person, each generation, each collective has to move toward more full realizations. And I know it's going to exist as compromised forms like um, the British Columbia Declaration uh, and the current Bill C-15. These are all deals and compromises about a deal and a compromise about a deal and a compromise that goes all the way down to the bottom. This isn't the ultimate truth. This is the guidelines that we need to realize in conduct and in practice, not in theory. And so we went to the UN where there were no voices. And we created many voices, uh, many diversities, and we have many mechanisms of the UN to continue those voices. But these voices are really um, an ongoing project. They're not complete. They're not finished. Just because we get a declaration, it doesn't mean it contains all the spirit of our future possibilities. And we have to really understand that, that there's much work that needs to be done and my son asked me um, a few nights ago as he's trying to prepare for the, the debates in um, the parliament, you know, would the drafting of uh, the declaration be easier today? And I said, no, it, it would be as hard today as it was then, that nothing has really changed except we compromised to make a deal for this generation that the next generation is going to have to improve. That there's a cynical attitude in government and there's a cynical attitude on the reserve and the streets and the challenge remains. But one of the imperatives, imperatives and the most urgent rights that's required is the full effect and recognition that we carry this spirit we're calling self-determination. It's a fire within us. It's the fire where we want to go. And it's invisible until we perform it. And by performing it, I mean living up to it on a daily basis, not on a organizational basis as well. But we have to, as humans, be the animating force for this spirit. And we're going to run into a lot of mountains, a lot of obstacles, a lot of uh, generational problems. And that's just the process of moving the world toward a better understanding that humanity is the core of power, not power for its own sake. And that's a, something that the this generation's moving on. Many Latin American countries have moved it into their constitution. Uh, we've I've been amazed by the acceptance, even of the people who told us that this would ruin the UN of being a positive force of the UN. I want to say thank you. Thank you, Sakesh, for putting that human face on that uh, diplomatic journey. Uh, the, the book is Indigenous Diplomacy and the Rights of Peoples, Achieving UN Recognition. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our, our relative Tom Cotton to close our house for today. But I want to raise my hands and thanks. I've been following the chat and uh, people just want, want to learn more. So if you would like to learn more, uh, you can read Sakesh's book and, uh, and uh, reach out to him if you need to find out what's going on in the world too. So. And a quick reminder, Ted, that uh, thank you to UBC Press. They've given us a discount on purchasing Sackage book. Just go to the website, the TRC 57 speaker series.ca and purchase it from there. Hi, Uncle.
Lake Winnesteea Thama, Sakej, uh, E. Machwet, uh, Tsewistin, Holmach, Mestimoch, to Canada. Really want to thank you and everybody that is moving uh, our great spirit forward and that fire within us. Uh, really inspires me to want to learn a lot more than you know everything that I'm working on these days but you've taken it to a whole nother level of awareness and a different realm inside me to want to be stronger and uh, fight that much harder in my own little area of the world so Heichka for sharing your words and everything that uh, all of you have done for the plight of our, our Hulmach so uh, Heichka Thanks for joining us, everybody, and uh, especially you, our special guest today, Sahaj. Yeah, it was.